Uh, if I haven't got to meet you yet, my name's Christian. I get to serve our church as one of our elders. Um, and before we come to God's word, to hear it read and to pray through it and to learn it and to apply it to our lives, let me do the one thing I always forget. I typically remember to do all those things in the course of a sermon. I almost always forget to invite the gospel warriors to go upstairs. Um, as I was talking about, so if you're an elementary age uh, boy or girl, please head upstairs where we will teach the gospel to you. Um, moms and dads, I, I have four children myself. Be encouraged that we have men and women and children who are going upstairs to learn the truth of Scripture, not just to make us better people, which could never really happen, but to be encouraged that the good news of Jesus is good even for little children. Um, so while the, while the elephants are trampling upstairs, uh, if you have a copy of the Bible, either a, a, a book copy or on your phone, let me invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. And, and, and if you're already there or if, you've already, uh, if you're familiar with the Gospel of Matthew, you'll find out soon enough, Matthew 12 is a really long chapter, uh, which gives us an opportunity to ask, this is actually the next to last week we'll be studying Matthew for now. Uh, next week, uh, we'll look at Matthew chapter 13, and then we'll move on to a different part of Scripture. And when we come to a really long chapter like this, even before we pray and ask for God's help and before we read it together, it's worth asking, why in the world are we flying through Matthew so fast? And why are we taking such a huge chunk of Scripture and trying to learn from it at this pace? I, I love the fact that our church, as a family of brothers and sisters, loves the Bible, and we love Bible study. We love going deep and learning more. There is a benefit to that, and you'll never hear me say otherwise. But let's also remember there is a benefit to seeing the forest as well as the trees. There's a benefit to reading the Gospel of Matthew like it was written. In other words, to be read in big chunks. They're, they're, each of the stories we'll read through, and I'll preach in just a moment, are worthy of their own sermons. And I would encourage you in your own time to, to dig deep and to pray and to think and to study. This morning, we're going to drink from the fire hydrant. I will not try to say every good thing that could be said. Um, but together, let's see what is the Lord showing us about Jesus Christ in a number of stories. I, I really am convinced as we read this, and I hope you see this too, if you don't see it, then either I'm wrong about what I see, or I'm doing a bad job preaching, neither of which are good. So if, if I say something that doesn't match up with what we see here, come talk to me, please, for my own sake and for the church's sake. But I think what we see in Matthew chapter 12 is something that can be said in one sermon. So let's, let's test this theory together, right? Let, let's ask God to help us. Let's ask him to teach us as we read, literally as we read, let's ask God to teach our hearts and our minds. And then let's pray that what we see together in, in my preaching would encourage us all, would make us see the beauty of Jesus and become more like him. Pray with me because I can't do that. I can't study enough and y'all can't make me do that. Only the Spirit can help us. So please come with me to Jesus and let's pray together. Father, Son, and Spirit, please open our minds and our eyes and our hearts to the beautiful things that are right in front of us. Um, you are good, and you do good. And so please teach us your word. Teach us in our minds that we would know and understand what you want us to, and, and teach our hearts that we would long for and desire the things that you long for and desire. Lord, teach our, our whole selves that at work and at home and in our neighborhoods and in your church and among our family and friends, in Effingham and Savannah and to the farthest parts of the world, Jesus Christ would be praised and loved and obeyed because you deserve it. Do that in the part you want it to be done this morning through the reading and the preaching of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen very carefully because whatever I've said up to now and whatever I say after this it, I, is a, an informed opinion. But this is not an opinion of any person. This is the word of God. So listen very carefully to Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, haven't you read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, 
nor for those who are with him, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. They asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? (laughs) He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy, like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known this was to fulfill this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet isaiah behold my servant whom i've chosen my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased i will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. In a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw, and all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. No city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons... By Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? then indeed he may plunder the house. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how how can you speak good when you're evil? 
For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. But then some of the scribes and Pharisee, the Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit's gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. While he was still speaking to the people, Behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside waiting to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward the disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister. And mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Y'all, the, the heart of this chapter is found starting in verse 15. Everything Matthew says is, is proving something he says here, where he quotes from the Old Testament, where he says that everything that happens in this chapter is proving something that God first said 700 years earlier through the prophet Isaiah, that Jesus. This is Matthew's point. Jesus is God's long-ago promised prophet. And, and let's, again, remember this. This is a very important Bible study method. Remember, a prophet is not necessarily someone who predicts the future. A prophet, very simply, is a person who says what God says to other people. He's just an errand boy. Jesus is God's chosen prophet with a capital P in a way that no other prophet was. He delivered the message in its fullest sense, in its purest form, in its most important urgency. Jesus is the prophet who was promised by Isaiah, who would, who would bring what's right into a world that is so wrong. And he would do it, according to Isaiah, quietly. And he would bring that message generously. And he would bring the message, first and foremost, to weak people and to poor people, to, to people who were excluded. Everything else that happens in that chapter is proving that Jesus is the prophet, and you can tell based on what he says and how he says it. The three stories that come before and after make it really clear that the first people that Matthew shows to oppose Jesus. Have you guys noticed that? This is the first time in the book of Matthew that anyone's said boo against Jesus. He promised that suffering would come when his disciples went out, and he taught about persecution in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first time Matthew shows somebody really being ticked off at Jesus. 
And why are they ticked off? These three stories are all three stories of people being mad at Jesus based on what he says. They're ticked off. They even, it says in verse 14, they want to destroy Jesus because their religion is part of the problem with the world. And when you bring a message of, of what's right and the way things ought to be done, that really, very simply, that, the word in the Bible for that is justice. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the Hebrew language and the Greek language, there's one word that in English we translate either righteousness or justice. They both just mean what ought to be done. Justice just means the right thing. And, and Jesus, we read, according to the prophecy of Isaiah, will bring justice. He will bring what's right what ought to be done. And the people who oppose that message, the people who oppose this kingdom where what's right is done, like for real done, the people who oppose that are doing so because they are wrong. And their religion, the Pharisees' religion, is unjust. Jesus came to bring justice. The unjust oppose him, but the kingdom of God, delivered in Jesus and by Jesus, has come not just to wag fingers at people, it has come to actually bring the right thing, to overthrow the evils and the injustices that are done in the name of God in his own day and even in our day if we will listen to him. Really simply, here's the big point. If you're a note taker, here's the summary. One sentence, so what are you saying? Matthew chapter 12 is saying this. Jesus is the spirit-filled servant of God whose message corrects unjust religion. Jesus is the spirit-filled servant of God whose message corrects unjust religion. And the first way we see that is in verses 1 to 14. Specifically, Jesus' message corrects the abuse of God's mercy-oriented law. We're going to get real familiar with these guys in this chapter and in the chapters to come. So let's real quick ask the question, because they seem to be the bad guys here. Who are the Pharisees? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a title and a name we use. It, I actually kind of laugh when I read the first couple of verses of chapter 12, because as we see this picture painted of Jesus and his, his guys, his, his disciples, his apprentices, walking along the road on this three-year-long camping trip that is their life with Jesus in his earthly ministry, they're hungry, and they're kind of literally just running their hands along these waves of grain and rubbing the paper off and popping them in their mouth. Because they're, Do you know how hungry you'd have to be to eat raw grain? <laughs> they, that's how hungry they are. And evidently, it's like the Pharisees are like hiding behind a rock and like twiddling their mustache, and they pop out. They're like, ha ha! I saw it. They did what they're not supposed to do. Teacher, get on to them. Who are these guys? We, we, this is really important, not only for the study of the book of Matthew, but for the rest of the New Testament. The Pharisees are not a job. Your job was not to be a Pharisee. There were Pharisees who were butchers and bakers and candlestick makers and homemakers. The Pharisee was not a job or a calling. It was a particular way of being Jewish. It was an interpretation of what the Old Testament said. It, for lack of a better term, we, we could use the word, it was a denomination, of Jewish folks. And in Jesus' day, the denomination of the Pharisees were the, the Bible believers, as opposed to other parties, the New Testament uses that word, um, other sects of Judaism. The, the Pharisees were the Bible-believing Jews. They believed the whole Word of God. They took it incredibly seriously. They devoted all their time and energy to studying it well. So right off the bat, let me say, I'm Southern Baptist born and Southern Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Southern Baptist dead. Like uh, these, uh, I get a little nervous right here because the people who oppose Jesus in this story and, and stories to come are a lot more like us than we might be comfortable with. I'm not saying we are Pharisees, but let's let's be really really clear. The people who get mad at Jesus first in the book of Matthew are the people who take the Bible seriously. It's not the the liberals, and it's not even the pagans. It's well, people who love the Bible. And, and because they loved the Bible, we have to understand this about the Pharisees. This is what Jesus rails on so much. that The Pharisees rightly understood that the law is a gift of God given to, to mankind for us to understand who he is and his heart and what it means to know him and what it looks like to live in his world, knowing him and following him and loving our neighbors well. The law is a precious gift. But if you and I are sinners, which we very obviously are, 
if we compare our lives to the law, the, the law is like a nuclear reactor. It is powerful and it's glorious and it is dangerous for sinners to get too close. Because we are judged by it. We are condemned by it every time we read it. And so the Pharisees, out of a very understandable desire, decided, okay, if it's dangerous to get too close to this nuclear reactor of God's holiness and goodness, I don't want anybody to get too close to I don't want anyone to be endangered by it. So what we'll do is, understandably, we will create traditions and interpretations of the law that basically build a fence around it so that nobody gets too close you know if you worry am am, am i breaking the law am i disobeying god don't worry because we've set up a tradition that will keep you from getting too close to that does that not make perfect sense if 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 they if there's a good desire not to break god's law that that makes perfect sense there's the part of the grand canyon i visited there's a there's a fence so you don't get too close to it. it it makes sense if there's danger. The only problem is, God hates it. God, God does not appreciate us extending artificially the power of the law. In fact, what we see here is that this law that was meant to protect sinners because of the man-made traditions and and extra rules that were added on to the law to keep us from breaking the law, what's the end result of it? It's not necessarily that people are holier or more loving or more kind. What it means is that in the first story, starving people are not allowed to eat. And in the second story, a man who is handicapped is not allowed to be healed. Why? Not because it breaks the Sabbath, according to the Bible, but because it breaks the fence we built around the laws about breaking the Sabbath. Are y'all tracking with that? The Pharisees' unjust religion would keep hungry people starving and disabled people from being restored. And so how does Jesus bring justice? How does, how does Jesus bring the right thing into a jacked up situation? The Pharisees blocked the law. The Pharisees used the law as a dam to protect the law. But what did it do? It blocked love from going out. They abused the law. Jesus uses the law as it was always always meant to be used. Jesus uses the law not to dam up love, but to channel it and to focus it. Jesus has the authority to do that. I don't know if that blows you away like it does me, but his kind of mic drop moment there in verse 8, as he interprets the Sabbath law, he says, oh, and by the way, I, the, the Son of Man, which just means a human being. It's, it's the word he uses for himself so often in the Gospels. I have the right to do this because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I, I'm the master. I'm the, I, not to brag, but I'm the boss of the Sabbath day. I get to figure out what is and what isn't okay to do on this day of rest. And I say, let the hungry people eat. <laughs> and, and let the weak people, let the sick people be restored. Just a, a quick aside, we literally could have an entire sermon just on this. Note carefully here that Jesus, in this story, does not come anywhere close to saying, oh, P.S., the Sabbath is gone now. No, no. No need to undo it. No need to erase it. I know my father and my spirit and I, we put it in the top ten commandments, um, but we just decided that number four is no longer necessary. He doesn't say that. In fact, if we wanted to, we could look at Genesis chapter two. Before sin entered the world, before injustice wrecked everything, and we could see in Genesis chapter two that God instituted the Sabbath day. He baked it into creation for our good. And so what it looks like to keep the Sabbath may well have changed in some ways, and and different Christians who truly love and follow Jesus may read that differently. But let's be clear here, when we read the story, Jesus is not doing away with the Sabbath. He's doing away with an awful misinterpretation of the Sabbath that flies in the face of what it was always supposed to do. He does not truck with his Father's name being used to withhold good from people who need it. And I love the way he corrects them in this first story. As we we see the chapter go on, maybe you could notice that as well. Jesus is going to change his tactics 
with the Pharisees. He's going to get more aggressive and more blunt with them as this chapter and as the book of Matthew goes on. But I love this. The, he asks the Bible-believing, Scripture-studying Pharisees in verses 3 and verse 5, haven't you read? Do you not... Do you, do you see the not-so-subtle put down here? Do you guys know the Bible? You ever, like, read this very important story in the life of King David? You ever read how, in the law, literally everything the priests are told to do breaks the Sabbath? Are you guys familiar with the Old Testament? Jesus has no shame challenging pride. Because any Pharisee would say, well, of course we've read those stories. And we can see in Jesus' response, he's saying, I don't know that you, I don't, you read it, but I don't think you got it. Because what he's saying is that David, in this story from 1 Samuel, ate food that God prohibited anybody who wasn't a priest from eating. Why did David and his men do that? Because they were starving. The priests, they worked harder on the Sabbath day than any other day of the week. But that was part of keeping the Sabbath, not breaking it. Now, imagine the life of an Old Testament priest on the Sabbath day. They kept the Sabbath by butchering and breaking down animals, by nearly sweating to death in the process, so that God's people could be reconciled to him by trusting in his word, by trusting that the sacrifice of this innocent, unblemished, substitute animal, by trusting that what God says would work, that that would atone for the people's injustices. They worked themselves to the bone on the Sabbath day. And God says, that's exactly what I want them to do. Because that means sinners can be reconciled to me. The point is, what Jesus' point is, we were not created to serve the law. The law was given to mankind to serve us, to bless us, to teach us about God's heart, and to teach us how loving each other looks. The Pharisees' traditions, like I've already said, were like a dam. They, 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 they took this mighty power of God to help and encourage people, to teach them, and they stopped it up, and they said, no more. We will not allow love to flow past this, because it might be dangerous. And what Christ does is simply to point out what the law was always saying, which is the law is not a dam that stops up love. The law channels and it focuses love. It helps us go beyond a, well, I guess I just love everybody, but I don't really know what that looks like. A weak love, a powerless love that does no good for anybody. Jesus shows that the law was always meant to be like a laser. Instead of spreading the light out in every way, let's condense it. Let's focus it. Let's give it direction so that it can do something. And the Pharisees completely missed the point. Look at this Jesus. Look at this, this man who perfectly keeps the spirit of the law. Mercy toward others is more important than merely going by the letter of the law. That's exactly what Jesus means in verse 7 when he again quotes an Old Testament prophet to say, not that sacrifice doesn't matter, but do you not know what the point of the sacrifice is? This was a problem in Old Testament Israel and it is a, prom a problem in Jesus' day. The law's goal, the point of God's word, is to form sinful people who trust in him into merciful people who love God and who love the neighbors that he gives us. Sacrifice, as a part of the law, the law itself is a means to an end. And that's always been the case in God's kingdom. Not just in the new era Jesus has ushered in. That was always the point of the law. Jesus is not changing the law. He's certainly not breaking the law. He's keeping the law, even if that ticks off some other people who have very strong opinions about it. Jesus keeps the Sabbath as he breaks the Pharisees' rules about the Sabbath. He uses the day of rest to give rest 
to hurting people, to hungry people. Jesus cares about his disciples' hunger, so he, as God himself, he creates grain and he sustains grain. He gives it growth so that as they're walking along, they can eat popcorn shells. <laughs> If that's all there is, because he loves his disciples. He, he cares about this man's physical handicap with his hand, so he heals him. Jesus cares about the Pharisees, so he tells them that they're wrong. And he tells them what's right instead, so that they can be and do what is right. That they could be just. Jesus is the most righteous, pious holy, law-keeping person who ever lived, and you can know that. But not because of taboos that he strayed away from. You know that Jesus is holy and righteous, not because of what he didn't do, but because of what he does. That has always been what the law was forming us to do. And that is the message that God's spirit-filled prophet brings to the world. And, and y'all, this story shows us, and maybe you are confronted like I am with this as well, one way we can know if we are right about the kingdom of God. Just ask yourself very simply, based on this story, how do you respond to finding out you're wrong about anything, big or small? People in the kingdom are and are more and more being formed into humble people. Kingdom people are humble people because you could never get into the kingdom if you didn't at least open up to the possibility that I'm wrong. I'm deeply wrong about some things in my life. On my own, I'm wrong a lot. You don't get into the kingdom that requires trusting in Jesus and his message and repenting of sin and changing and saying, I need help to change, but I, I want to because I'm wrong. You don't get into the kingdom without admitting I'm wrong even about big stuff apart from God's help. People in the kingdom are able to be humble, and they're able to admit that they're wrong, but when they're criticized, they, they compare the criticism to the word of God. Am I actually wrong? Oh, oh my goodness, like someone pointed this out, my wife pointed this out, or my kids pointed this out, or this guy at work pointed something out, and when I look at what the Bible says, he's right, she's right, I'm wrong. But the Pharisees are not yet in God's kingdom. And how do you know that? Not merely because they're wrong about really big things, but because of how they respond to finding out they're wrong. Verse 28, the kingdom of God has come upon them, our translation reads. It's come right in their faces. But when there is the slightest insinuation that they're wrong, when Jesus corrects something they hold very dear, they lash out at Jesus. They privately, we see in verse 14, they privately conspire against him how to destroy him. And they publicly slander him, as we see. But he's able to take that. He's able to take that abuse because he came to fix abuse. So yes, first of all, we need to see that Jesus is God's messenger and his message corrects and changes and helps us see very carefully the abuse of God's mercy-oriented law. We need to see that first. But secondly, what do we see? Jesus' message also corrects the satanic denial of the Spirit's work. Look at the injustice of the Pharisees, starting in verse 22. Once again, Jesus brings the kingdom of God with word and with deed to a man who is suffering terribly. What, what a terrible trio. He's possessed by demons, he is blind, and he is mute. And, and Matthew's summary of what happens is so short, it can't, it's obviously it can't be the point. Matthew's summary is, and Jesus healed him. As if that's not a huge deal! <laughs> For Matthew, that's not the biggest deal about this story. The miracle is not the point. The point is the real conflict that we need to see comes when the Pharisees see a poor, suffering guy receive freedom and healing. It disgusts them. There's no joy for this guy. There's no gratitude 
that God has done a supernaturally kind thing for this poor man. They would rather people suffer than Jesus be loved. We, we see here all, all the people whose respect and admiration the Pharisees crave, all the people saw what happened, and they, y'all, do y'all know this? They had the gall. They had the audacity, as my grandmother would say, the audacity to suggest that in light of all the supernatural, freaky-deaky stuff that they were seeing with their own eyes, they had the audacity to suggest that maybe, just maybe, there was something special about Jesus. Maybe even, Perhaps, possibly, he could be the son of David. Which for a Jewish person in Jesus' day, I mean, that's, that's swinging for the fences to say that. The, the son of David. The, the, the Hebrew word would be Messiah. The, the Greek word would be, he, maybe he's the Christ. He, may, maybe he is the chosen one who would bring all of God's promises to pass, who would make every sad thing come untrue, who would fix everything. The people just connect two and two and say, well, I don't know, could it be Jesus? And that ticks the Pharisees off. They couldn't, look at their reply here, starting in verse 24. They could not be more bitter. We can't read tone in the Bible, but based on their words, can you not just feel kind of a curl and a sneer in their lip as they say, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this guy casts out demons. They love their own position. They love their own reputation as the most spiritually mature people around. That when that position, when that reputation is threatened by Jesus, they use the God-given proof authenticating Jesus' ministry against him. Jesus' healing doesn't prove that he's been sent by God to the Pharisees. It proves he's in league with the devil. How does Jesus bring justice to that? How does, he, how does he bring the right and the good thing to bear? I, I, y'all may have read this news story like I did, that recently um, there was, there's a legal case, I believe it's still ongoing, against a person who made just demonstrably false claims about a company. Um, and the company in return sued her for making these obviously and demonstrably false claims. And her own defense attorneys... I've never, I've never, I'm not a, I watch a, law, a lot of Law and Order, but I'm not a legal guy. Um, so if even Law and Order hasn't mined this defense in 20-something years, maybe 30 now, then something's up. Her own defense attorneys, her, her defense is this. No serious person would have taken her word seriously. Her defense is, I mean, come on, you didn't really believe her, did you? Do, do you see the defense? The, the best thing we can find in this case is, her words shouldn't count. Because they're just words. The, the wisdom of the Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 26, says, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. That, the person who uses words like that and then tries to blow it off like no big deal, is a terrorist, is an insane person. Jesus' response to the Pharisees' demonstrably false claims is not, at its heart, defending himself and his ministry. Jesus quickly turns the conversation to the work of the Father that he is doing through the power of the Spirit. And he's warning the Pharisees, and he's warning us if we're listening, that what we say about the work of the Spirit has never-ending consequences. We, we read here about the unforgivable sin, the sin of blaspheming. And, and blaspheme is a Bible word. It literally just means saying something angry against or slandering, bad-mouthing. The, the unforgivable sin is bad-mouthing the Holy Spirit. And understandably, many of us have, have worried. I've met so many people who are burdened with terrible anxiety. Have I done that? Like, but before I was a Christian, much more likely. But, but even as, a, as someone who I thought I was following Jesus, but have I bad-mouthed the Holy Spirit in such a way that I will go to hell and there's nothing that can be done about it? So here's the one time in this sermon when we are going to slow down and dive down because I know this is so pastorally important. What is the unforgivable sin? 
Let's be good students of the Bible. Let's see this together. Let's look at the context. What is the unforgivable sin? The Pharisees in this story make an outrageous claim about the true story, the true source of Jesus' power. Jesus responds by saying, it isn't Satan, it's the Spirit of God who enables him to cast out demons. That's verse 28. It's the Spirit of God who gives him his power. And it's the presence of the Spirit that shows Jesus is not just a miracle worker, he is ushering in the kingdom of God as the Pharisees look on. And those who oppose him, verse 30, those who oppose him bringing the kingdom and the message about it, they are not neutral. There's, no, there's nobody in the peanut gallery who's undecided. You're either with him, he says, in that mission, or you're against him. And then what comes next? Therefore, verse 31, therefore, because of that, blaspheming or bad-mouthing the Spirit won't be forgiven, not in this world and not in the world to come. Verse 32. What comes next? 33 through 37, this paragraph, Jesus, and he's saying what, well, I think we all understand, at least in a common sense way, what you say reveals who you are on the inside. From a biblical perspective, and I think we all get this in some way, there's no such thing as what I said doesn't really reflect who I am. We, we can all misspeak, we can all say something we wish we could take back, that's certainly true, but the Bible says we only say those things because that's in our heart in the first place. Our words, therefore, don't determine whether we are saved or damned. They don't determine that, but they do confirm either our present state of being forgiven and changed as part of God's kingdom. They confirm that present reality, or they confirm the present reality of we have not yet been changed. We have not yet trusted in Christ and come into his kingdom. Our words don't have the power to determine, but they have a great power to confirm. How do we put all that together? By saying this. By saying that Jesus' miracles are powered by Satan and not the Holy Spirit, the Pharisees are slandering the good and the right work that the Spirit does in bringing the kingdom to hurting people. That they're calling God's work evil. They're rejecting the work of the Spirit in bringing God's kingdom into the world. And if you stiff arm God's good intention, you stiff arm his motivation and his heart of love, if you, if you stiff arm love and kindness toward the poor and the weak and the needy, if you stiff arm the kingdom, you can only do that from a position of being outside the kingdom. And so if, if those are our words and our actions, we're, we're just confirming what's presently true about us, that we are outside the kingdom. And if that remains our attitude, then we will remain outside the kingdom forever with eternally awful consequences. But, hear me, I, I know there are some of us in this church who struggle with anxiety and great fear and guilt. Hear me so carefully. Jesus is not saying, if you have ever said anything bad about God, if you have ever rejected the kingdom, you are damned without hope. He is not saying that. How do I know that? Is it because I want it to be true? I do want it to be true. But because the Bible tells us so. Look at what 33 to 37 says. Trees are known by their fruit. But Jesus commands the Pharisees to change what kind of tree they are. <laughs> it's a weird mixed metaphor. But you see what his heart is saying to us there. As long as they are breathing, there is still time for them to change their mind. There's still time for you to change your mind. There's still time for them to recognize the healing and the forgiving power of God, especially as it comes to very unreputable, bad people. That power, that kindness that Jesus is bringing into the world is precisely what God has promised to do throughout the scriptures through his chosen servant. And there is an opportunity to these people. And there is an opportunity for us people to say, I was wrong about this. I was wrong about this whole thing. And I'm so sorry. 
And I understand now that I will give account one day for all of the awful, stupid things I have said. And I want it on record. I want it to be known. I changed my mind before it was too late. I got off to an awful start. But I want it to be known that at the end, I changed my mind. I took Jesus at his word. I believe that what he is doing in the world is, and what God is doing through his kingdom in helping, in helping the weak and helping the poor and glorifying himself, I called it bad, but it's good. Friends, look at this Jesus who saves weak people in the power of the Spirit. We, we can't overlook that this whole thing comes about because Jesus restores a guy who is absolutely obviously and outwardly broken this man with the the poor shriveled up hand his his circumstances and what it looks like to have that handicap in this world very simply is not how the world was supposed to be and and, and with that definition his circumstances are unjust jesus brings justice to him he makes things right in some small way, that he makes the man's hand more like it was supposed to be. But pay careful attention to how Jesus speaks to the other people in this story who are broken. How, do, how does Jesus speak to the Pharisees? In God's eyes, they are just as absolutely, obviously, and outwardly broken. Not in their physical handicaps, but simply the way they talk and the words they use. Jesus righteously and mercifully brings justice to them by bringing the truth to them. The only difference is that the hurting man, maybe because he had no no other choice, the hurting man took Jesus at his word, that he had the power and he had the heart to help broken people. Friends, I don't know, I don't know so many of you, So many of your stories are brand new to me, but can I just say, with the authority, not of my desires, but of the Bible itself, there is no hell-raising, God-mocking, needy people overlooking people. There are no people like that who are too bad for God to forgive and to change. There there, there is such hope and power in God's kingdom. He is more merciful than you have ever been blasphemous. There is good news of this kingdom for you that you who can look back now or later and say, I was a moron, and I wish so many things had gone differently, but if there is any hope that Jesus could forgive and change me and make me someone who doesn't just live forever, but who changes me in this life, so that in this life I actually become a just person. I do the right thing. I don't know if that could ever happen to me. Friends, it can happen to you. There's such hope and power for you. Receive this word. Take Jesus at his promise. Do what the Pharisees did not and sadly would not do. Take Jesus at his word that he loves you, that he is powerful to change you. And he not only can change you, but he can use you to help the people around you. It's it's the promise of the gospel. It is good news. And let's, let's see one more thing as we run out of time. Let's see one more thing. Yes, Jesus' message about justice has come to correct abuse of the law. It's come to, what in the world is going on in this story? To uh, correct abuse against the power of the Spirit and lies about his kingdom. Lastly, Jesus' message corrects the Pharisees' faithless hunger for power. These last paragraphs tell the story of them demanding a sign, as if God is some kind of, like, like God's a vending machine. If we just push his buttons right, he'll do what we want. I've done that. Maybe you have too. Maybe it shouldn't surprise us that these people who don't take their own words very seriously don't take God's word very seriously. They, They hear what Jesus says and they demand some kind of authentication beyond what God has already supernaturally shown them. The scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes are those who have been, I think this is the first time we've seen them in Matthew, they are the people who are formally educated in the law. So a scribe could be a Pharisee, not every Pharisee was a scribe. They would not believe that God would accomplish his plan and bring the kingdom into the world without strongman tactics without great miracles and signs, at least great enough for them. 
Because we've seen Jesus heal about 13,000 people up to now. I don't know. And that's evidently not enough. 13,001 is the expectation. Jesus sees their addiction to power, their unhealthy need for God to show off according to their standards. And how does he bring justice to them? Well, he, he tells them, no. I'm not going to enable this addiction. I'm not going to show off. I'm not going to be pathetic enough to play your game. But I'm actually going to love you by telling you the truth, which is this. You already have what you need in the word of God to trust me. The story of Jonah, this real thing that happened to him being swallowed by a sea monster for three days, if you want to wait to see something amazing, can I tell you what I'm going to do after three days? Can I, can I show you that I, um, I'm not more, it's, it's not just that I'm a great teacher, um, I am actually going to beat death and hell and Satan and the world and those who hate me. I'm, I'm going to beat them. So you can hold on for that. But until that happens, just know that at the judgment, these Gentiles, whom you Pharisees hate, non-Jewish people like the Ninevites who heard Jonah preach, the Queen of the South, which is another word for the Queen of Sheba, who we see in 1 Kings, comes to bask in Solomon's wisdom. These Gentiles got it in a way that y'all don't get it right now. Not because they were smarter or better, but because they heard God say something and they, they believed it. They took him at his word. Brothers and sisters, look at this Jesus who proves God's word, not just by correcting the bad guys and outsmarting them, but how does this chapter end? What's the ultimate proof of Jesus' wisdom and power? It's the way that he doesn't just forgive people. He adopts us into his family. I wish I had another 45 minutes to, to preach on this one paragraph. Because in my own story of growing up in a non-Christian home and, and never hearing the gospel until I was in middle school and then rejecting the gospel until I, I was older and then being an absolute moron in my 20s, I wish I could tell you how important it has been for me to see that Jesus treats me like a little brother. That, that the people who have been so broken and made so many mistakes in their lives, but who have loved me because they love Jesus, are my spiritual parents who have invested in me. I, I wish I could tell you more about that, but what I see is this. Who gets in on that? Who, who gets invited into a community of people who forgive you no matter how screwed up you are and who love you enough to tell you the truth and who comfort you and encourage you and challenge you and are there for you and if you run off the reservation, they will go chasing after you. I wish I had more time to tell you that who gets in on that? People who take Jesus at his word. People like us who have so many different stories and backgrounds. But now, despite our weaknesses and our sins, we are in this together. Broken and stupid as we still are, Jesus has made us sit at the same table. And he is feeding us with the same work of the power of the Spirit. He's growing us to become more like him, and he's using us to do that as we grow in patience and gentleness, and kindness, the things that a real powerful person would do. It doesn't take that much power to do a miracle. It takes a lot of power to restrain yourself when you are angry and to bear with people who have gotten on your last nerve. And when they've done it for the 13,000th time, you remain gentle. That is, that's a powerful person right there. And, and, and as we want to become more like that at OSC, and we want Effingham County and, and Savannah to be more and more filled with people like that, all we have to give them is a message and kindness, both of which are fueled by the Holy Spirit, and both of which are so often fueled at this table that we, we come to now. We, we take this little piece of bread, bread-like substance, and we take this little thimble of juice, and because of God's promise in the New Testament, we believe that if we have trusted in and been changed by the power of the Spirit, by believing in Jesus, that does something powerful. That as we come to the table, we trust and obey, obey Jesus. There is an invitation for us to sit at a literal table one day in the new heavens and earth. But in this life, to enjoy a Thanksgiving dinner, a, a table fellowship not just with each other, but with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And if we enjoy fellowship with Him, this one God in three persons, then we enjoy fellowship with each other. 
even if we have nothing in common except Jesus, because that's good enough. And so, brothers and sisters, in a moment, I'll pray, and then um, I guess we don't have a musician anymore, do we? He's coming, thank you. In a moment, there will magically appear a musician behind me who will play a song. Um, and as the song is playing, please, if you trust in Jesus and for better or for worse, have cast all your chips on him to bring this message of, of the kingdom of God to you and through you to other people, if, that's, if you're all in on that and you've taken him at his word, for better or for worse, then please let me invite you to come to his table. C- come down the center aisle and then take a, a little cup and a thimble, and return to your seat, and we'll, we'll take and we'll eat and we'll drink together because we are a family, because the kingdom of God has come to us And unlike the Pharisees, eventually we got bowed down. And in humility, we received the message. Brothers and sisters, pray with me. We ask that you, Holy Spirit, would come. That you would take your word, plant it deep in our hearts. The seed would germinate, would bear fruit, not only for our joy and for your glory, but for the good of our kids and our parents and siblings, for the people in our neighborhoods and at work. We desire that this sacrament of the the supper according to what you've said in your word, would change and help us. We are very weak, but you are very strong. So please help us and glorify yourself and strengthen us for duty and mission and mercy. In your name, Jesus. Amen.